Welcome to the October 2024 Talk with a Doc with Dr. Timothy Licklider of Allegheny Health Network. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Dr. Licklider. It's, I'll take it away, please, Dr. Done. Licklider. Done. Welcome back to the party. I don't have a tie on because I wasn't seeing patients today. I was continuing mm -hmm. my medical education. You'll have to forgive me. Don't worry, mm -hmm. I'm back to seeing patients again tomorrow. Welcome, everybody. Um, for those of you who know me, welcome back. If you've been here before, if you're not, if you're new, if this is your first time coming to a talk with the doc session, welcome to the party. I'm Dr. Licklider, presumed movement disorder specialist sitting here in my office at Allegheny General Hospital. A um, couple of things that I always throw out is this is a general information session, so feel free to type your questions into the chat box. Um, I do have some in my email, so you'll see me looking over here for my email, and then I'll come back here uh, that I'll start with first. Good place for general information, not a great place for individualized treatment. Um, you're better off talking to your doctor about that. Um, and then the last thing I always like to tell people is what you're about to get is all of my opinion. I have a lot of opinions, and I will tell you all of my opinions on everything you want to know my opinion on. Um I think my opinion is based in as much fact as I can give you, but that's not always true. Sometimes I have to make some stuff up, and I will tell you when I'm making stuff up. But if you go to a different neurologist or you go to a different movement disorder specialist, you may very well get a different opinion. That's just how opinions work. Uh, so take mine with a grain of salt. With that being said, I will start with the questions that I got in my email first, and then I'll come to the chat box. Again, That type your questions into the chat box. That's where I go to next. Uh, once I finish all these questions, which I got a, a handful. So the first one I got was, and, and the drug got cut off, but based on the question, I'm assuming it's going to be Azelect. So uh, they've been on Azelect uh, for Parkinson's disease downtime, no change. And at the end of the day, they were talking about side effects. And so this is not an uncommon situation for me, where from reading the explanation of side effects, I have concerns about the consumption of foods containing tyramine. The guidelines are very strict. Tyramine foods include processed cheese, blah, 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 whole, basically everything good to eat. Um, <clears throat> so far, the professionals I have talked to do not seem to consider strict adherence to avoiding these foods critical. They don't say to disregard the caution, but aren't particularly concerned. The risk is dangerously high blood pressure. I have a problem with low blood pressure, mostly in the morning, causes dizziness. They don't want to make the dizziness worse. They were prepared to observe these restrictions if that was necessary, but basically wanted to know my thoughts. <clears throat> so azelect or is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So what it does is monoamine oxidase breaks down dopamine, converts dopamine into a byproduct. So if you block monoamine oxidase in the brain, you keep dopamine around longer. That's the goal in Parkinson's disease. Generally, the medicines we're aiming at are aimed at increasing the amount of dopamine you have. Now, medicines like resagiline, which is Azelect, Safinamine, which is a Zadago, and Selegiline, which is the old Zelopar or some other name that I can't remember offhand, um, are all in this monoamine oxidase inhibitor category. Selegiline is probably the least brain-specific, but the two newer ones are brain-specific, and even Selegiline is fairly brain-specific. Now, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors are based loosely on old generalized monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which were old-fashioned antidepressants. These were not brain-specific drugs. These affected your whole body, and these did come with exactly that warning, which is you really couldn't eat anything good. No processed foods, no lunch meats, no cheeses, no pasta sauces, basically anything worth eating you couldn't eat because you run the risk of severely increasing your blood pressure to a very dangerous level. That is not as, as true necessarily with the newer versions of the MO inhibitor. So Azelect, even Selegiline, I tell people they, they can disregard that. They don't have to do it. When I was training, so Dr. Baser taught me everything I know. She used to tell people that Stilton cheese is the one thing you might want to be a little bit careful with. I, of course, didn't know what that was. Um, many of you may. So it's apparently a very fine stinky blue cheese which I've never had before. That in and of itself has enough tyramine in it to probably boost or elevate your blood pressure with or without the medicine. But I, I really don't tell my patients about any type of dietary restrictions. The other thing that comes along with this category of medicines is 10 times out of 10, it will flag from the pharmacy if you're on any type of antidepressant or similar medicines. At least in Azelect, in their studies, they had people on certain antidepressants. And so that's another thing that I don't necessarily say ignore. I do say ignore the food warnings 
but I don't necessarily say ignore, but I say it's something we have to keep an eye on. Again, as you, mo many of you probably know, you're on multiple different medicines and medicines definitely have interactions that we definitely have to pay attention to. And again, I usually say pay attention to your blood pressure because that's the one that we always worked on. So when I have patients on these medicines, I generally do say ignore any of the food warnings. I say I don't necessarily care that much about the warnings of antidepressants or some sleep medicines and things like that, but I at least pay attention to it. That's kind of my thoughts on the MAO inhibitors. Can I share my thoughts on the focused ultrasound, particularly who is the ideal candidate and what Parkinson's disease symptoms it addresses? Sure. So high-frequency ultrasound ablation is kind of the newest big topic of discussion in movement disorders for not just Parkinson's disease, but essential tremor and potentially dystonia. So it's a it's a less invasive surgical procedure that we use for tremors predominantly. And so at the end of the day, when I'm talking to my patients, I talk about deep brain stimulator surgery, which we talk about a lot of. That's invasive. It's very fairly aggressive. You drill holes into your skull. You have wires into your brain. You have internal machinery. Um, and we've been doing that for about 20 plus years. But the newer version of alternative treatment options to medications is something called high frequency ultrasound ablation, high foo, you'll, you'll see it called a whole bunch of different things. Now we learned a long time ago that if you put a hole in somebody's brain, you can stop them from shaking. Um, I think, although he's not my patient, Michael J. Fox had the old procedure where he actually had a hole drilled in his head. They put a probe down and they burned a hole in his brain. And they took it out. And I feel like he mentioned that in one of his books. That's why I feel relatively confident saying that. Um, that's how we used to put holes in people's brains. Fast forward to probably 30 plus years ago at this point, we learned that you could put a hole in somebody's brain through uh, stereotactic radio surgery. So you could radiate an area of the brain um, and it could cause damage in this area to, again, can help control tremors. Uh, fast forward to, I think, seven or eight years ago now, the University of Maryland was big in this research um, where they found that through MRI guidance, you could heat up the tissue using ultrasound focused in a, in a fine beam. Um, and you could put a hole in the brain that way too. And again, it doesn't require holes drilling, drill, being drilled into the skull. It doesn't have any internal machinery. Fast forward to today, we can get away sometimes with doing both sides, although they are staggered by about six or nine months apart. <clears throat> and so it's an alternative to deep brain stimulator surgery. Again, we obviously have much less um, experience with it, particularly in Pittsburgh, because to date, potentially soon changing, but to date, one doesn't exist in Pittsburgh. I generally send my patients down to West Virginia University or Cleveland Clinic, who both can do it. Um, and, and the long-term data it is not as long-term as DBS. Obviously, it hasn't been around as long, but it looks relatively okay. Um, and, and again, it's another intervention. It's not, I don't want to say it's not an intervention or risk. You still end up with a hole in your brain. Uh, again, we get there externally, but at the end of the day, you have a hole in your brain. And you can't say that that's non-invasive, but definitely less invasive than DBS. And I compare and contrast them. And there's pros and cons to both. Um, generally, at least my knowledge of it, which isn't as good as probably it could be or, or potentially people who do it more or have had more experience with it should be, um, its best use is for tremor. Um, it may impact the other symptoms as well. It comes with its own set of risks and, and potential side effects and complications and things like that. And these are all things you would discuss with the people sending you for it. Um, but it's another alternative to medication treatment strategy for people who are developing problems with their Parkinson's symptoms. The ideal person that from my standpoint is somebody who is tremor predominant, maybe who's somebody who has really more one-sided symptoms and probably somebody who's not a very good DBS candidate, either because you, you don't want the invasiveness of having a hole drilled into your head or the internal machinery, or maybe you're not as good of a surgical candidate because of some, <clears throat> some shrinkage of your brain or other various factors, or maybe you're just medical health isn't as good to undergo an actual neurosurgical intervention. I mean, those are the things that I think about when I'm trying to decide what's the next best choice for you. But it's individualized. And, and so realistically, these are conversations that I will have with you if you're my patient, or you really should have with your neurologist or your movement disorder specialist to not just talk about medications. And definitely we're going to talk about exercise. But when it gets to the point, you should at least keep in mind that there are other, there are other alternative treatment options that maybe should be considered. 
Um, and, and high frequency ultrasound is one of them. And it's probably the most rapidly growing. It's the one that there's the most interest in, in the community. There were definitely talks about it at the Congress that I was just at this past weekend. Um, and there was definitely evidence in, in posters and things like that about it. And so it is something that we have to consider. It's my job to keep all of these things in mind. And it's my job to explain why I think this is the best choice for you. And so, again, you, you should be at least be aware that there are non-medication alternative treatment options that we have. You should chat about with them with your neurologist or with your treating specialist, and they can go over the pros and cons and who is the right person and why we think this would be the best one for you, because it really is an individualized treatment strategy. And then I got a... It looked like just a, a blurb about a research study that's going on where they're looking at um, a different kind of ultrasound, so transcranial ultrasound stimulation, um, and particularly for freezing of gait. So it looks like, and this is out of, then tell me where it's out of. It's through the Parkinson's Foundation. I don't know if that's the Michael J. Fox Foundation or somebody, but anyway, there's a postdoctoral fellow named a name I'm probably not going to say correctly, Amitab Bhattacharya. Don't don't quote don't fact check me on that one. Um, but at the end of the day, they're doing a research on freezing of gait with this ultrasound, and they're using ultrasound of an area of the brain called the pedunculopontine nucleus or PPN. Now, this is not actually new. Uh, so the PPN is deep in the brain. Um, more in the brain stem. And, and this has been an area of the brain that we do think is involved in walking and balance and freezing of gait. At one point, I think it was a group out of Canada who tried putting deep brain stimulator leads in there, but you can imagine what happens when you stick deep brain stimulator leads into a very small and sensitive area of the brain that controls all basic functions of life. It's a little bit scary and dangerous. Needless to say, it hasn't necessarily been replicated all that much. Um, but I feel like there was a study quite a time ago using transcranial ultrasound in the back part of the brain, either the cerebellum or this PPN nucleus, to try to help with freezing of gait. And it did actually help patients with Parkinson's with freezing of gait. But if I remember correctly, and I'd have to go back and find the study, it seemingly only worked for people who also had concomitant depression. Now, interestingly enough, the main area of use of these transcranial magnetic stimulation or ultrasound stimulations are really in the psychiatric world. It's really in depression. It's really in anxiety. That's what these things are approved for. So if I remember that study correctly, I, I vaguely remember it being an interesting thing that it was really positive only for that specific population who also had concomitant depression. But any, anybody who wants to work on freezing of gait or anybody wants to give me another treatment option for walking and balance, I am all for it because as everybody in this call probably knows, that's one of the hardest things to try to work on from a medication standpoint. It doesn't respond very well to the dopamine medications, because we, partly because we think this area of the brain and the cerebellum are controlled more with acetylcholine than dopamine. Um, it doesn't seem to respond very well to deep brain stimulator surgery or ultrasound ablation. It is one of those areas of Parkinson's disease that is extremely difficult to treat. Um, and extremely dangerous because freezing of gait particularly leads to falls, and falls are one of the, if not the most dangerous problem for you. And so anybody wants to give me another treatment strategy or something that potentially works for this, I am all for it. Um, so I do look forward to that, that research study and see what they can come up with, especially if it's non-invasive. I mean, that's definitely better than a lot of the other things that we have. And so if you can give me a non-invasive way to work on freezing of gait, I have about 2,000 people that would say a unanimous thank you. Have any of your patients had Botox injections for bladder issues? If so, are they satisfied with the outcomes and does it help with frequency and urgency? I think so. I, I can't remember any of my patients offhand coming back and saying I'm getting injections for bladder, but I also don't have a great memory when it comes to remembering fine details about specific patients. I'm not going to lie. I feel like I have had some patients have Botox injections for bladder. So generally, Botox weakens muscles. And so if your bladder is spastic or contracted, which is what we often see in things like multiple sclerosis or stroke or things of that nature, it doesn't expand very well, and so you get a lot of urinary urgency, a lot of frequency, a lot of having to go. And if you can inject Botox into this area, so botulinum toxin or Botox weakens muscles, so if you can relax that muscle, it should help with the urgency and, and frequency that people with that type of a problem have. 
I'm not sure the same thing is true in Parkinson's disease, although it could very well be. A lot of different bladder issues happen in, happen in people with Parkinson's disease. And so if you do have that type of urgency and frequency, in my world, I usually send you to a urologist who does Botox injections anyway. That's the kind of person that would do that. Um, and so they can definitely give you a much better detailed answer as to whether or not it would be useful for you. Um, but I also know how much of a problem urology or urinary issues are. And so if it is something that helps, it, it's worth thinking about. Again, I don't do those kind of, I do Botox injections for just about every, for almost everything else, but that is one set of injections I don't personally do. Um, and so if you had questions about it, I would definitely send you to a urologist to talk about it. Um, but again, it is something to keep in mind because if it does work, if you have a lot of frequency and urgency and that's something that might help it, it might be worth your trouble. I have terrible dizziness upon standing and are and fall, ugh, falling frequently. I'm only on carbidopa, levodopa for my Parkinson's at this time. What can I do? Well, that's a difficult question. Sweet orange tea today, in case you were wondering. So it depends on where the dizziness is coming from. If the dizziness is blood pressure related, which is not uncommon uh, when you go from sitting to standing, well, then we need to work on your blood pressure. Now, the hard part about that is carbidopa, levodopa often lowers blood pressure. And so that's something we have to at least keep in mind. Either we need to adjust the timing or I may need to add something else for your blood pressure specifically in the morning to prevent it from going down. If the dizziness is because you're off, because you your pills wore off overnight, because you're only on carbidopa, levodopa a couple of times per day, and it doesn't last that long, well, then we need to address that problem. Maybe you need a controlled release at night, or we need to switch to Retari or Crexant, which we'll talk about because I know there's another question about it, <clears throat> or you need a new pro patch, or we need to do something different. And so the key to answering that question is actually to ask a bunch more questions, which is where do we think this dizziness is coming from? The key to fixing the dizziness is solving where it's coming from and, un and fixing that underlying problem. Because dizziness and lightheadedness, these are very, very common situations and complaints that I get. Maybe that's a side effect of your carbidopa, leave it open. I need to think of something different completely. Um, and so trying to sort through what's the underlying cause is going to be the best way to try to figure out the, an the, the last question, which is what can I do? The obvious things you can do are don't jump out of bed and run. Uh, again, I feel like most people are aware of this, but it, it still goes without, you know, with reiterating that you're not 20 anymore. You can't just spring out of bed and go for a jog. It doesn't work that way. Neither can I. Sit on the edge of the bed. Wait until you feel a little bit better. Stand holding on. Wait until you feel a little bit better before you get going. Make sure if you need an assistive device, if you need a cane or a walker in the morning, you have it by the bedside. Uh, making sure you're staying hydrated, even though I know none of my patients like to drink a lot, particularly later in the evening, because then they have to get up and go to the bathroom all the time. Well aware of that. You got to make sure you're eating enough because that also maintains blood pressure. And so anything you can do to maintain your blood pressure generally helps with lightheaded and dizziness. But realistically, at the end of the day, trying to figure out or sort through specifically what's causing your problem is going to be the best way to work on that. Please describe diagnosis and treatment of hallucinations and delusions. Sure. So hallucinations are actually seeing things that aren't there, hearing things that aren't there, feeling things that aren't there, smelling things that aren't there, or any other sense that you can think of that's not there. Delusions are more fixed beliefs. So they're thinking things that happening that aren't happening or thinking things that aren't real. And then there's illusions, which is seeing one thing and thinking it's something else. But these are all on a spectrum of hallucinations that come in a lot of my patients. Now, the hallucinations in Parkinson's disease are driven mostly by the medications. And so a lot of times if there's a, a an issue in my patient where hallucinations are becoming an issue, if I can decrease your dopamine medicines, your carbidopa, levodopa, your pramipexol, your, whatever you're on, that's great. Now, again, I would say nine times out of 10 or eight times out of 10, most people, even after we try that, you feel worse because, again, the medicines really are controlling your physical symptoms. And so if it's somebody that I cannot decrease the medications to try to help their hallucinations, then I have to add in something else. And this is where you'll see us use Nuplazid, which is Pimavanserin, which is the only actual FDA-approved medicine for psychosis and Parkinson's disease. But you'll also see us use Seroquel, which is Quetiapine, which has been around forever. Clozaril is probably one of the better drugs, but it's probably the most difficult to use just because you have to have your blood drawn so frequently in order to get the drug. But there are some treatment strategies 
that we will add to try to help with hallucinations and delusions. And sometimes it's a combination of both. Sometimes we need to decrease the medicines that we think are causing it and add medicines. The other thing I would caution you is anytime you're sick with something, hallucinations run rampant. So if somebody calls me up and they were typically doing okay, and then all of a sudden they woke up and they're hallucinating floridly, the first place I check is for urinary tract infection. That is the most common thing that triggers it in my patients. It can be a pneumonia. It can be a flu. It can be COVID. It could be just severe dehydration. Anything that stresses your symptom, your system can definitely lead to hallucinations and delusions. So if they come on all of a sudden, we should look for another cause. But other than that, if there's no other underlying cause or something that we can find, it's usually the medicines, and then we have to go back to the drawing board. That's kind of the long and short of it. Now, hallucinations are the hallmark of Lewy body disease, and so if it's not medication-driven, meaning you're not on a lot of medicine or there's no medicine at all, and you're still having hallucinations, then we start to think more along that lines, and then we have a different kind of strategy for what we do. Um, but these are all things that is really my job to try to sort through and figure out and figure out what the best plan is for it. <clears throat> is there any way to prevent nighttime drooling? Well, sort of. So drooling is difficult in my patients day or night. Nighttime seems to be when it's most common. Now, if it's nighttime drooling, again, because you're wearing off, well, then maybe adjusting your medication regimen might help. But that's not usually the case. It's usually just that your mouth hangs open and secretions tend to come out. And then we talk about what other options we have. So there's definitely some medicines that we'll use um, to try to help with drooling. Uh, you'll see us use robinol, which is glycopyrrolate. Sometimes we'll use atropine drops. Sometimes we'll use a scopolamine patch. I mean, again, the downside is all of these come with the anticholinergic side effects, which is confusion and things like that, potentially. Probably what I've had the best success in my patients with drooling is injections. So I'll do botulinum toxin injections, either myoblock or Botox or Xeomin. Um, the downside of that is, well, I have to jam a needle into your face a bunch of times. And while it's never hurt me, it definitely has hurt some other people. And so that's something worth thinking about. But that's probably what I've had the best success with in terms of managing drooling. But I also have no trouble trying different medicines to see if that would help. Again, during the day, other people also can chew gum or have a piece of candy in their mouth. But at nighttime, that's a little bit more difficult. And so that's a common problem. And there's a few different ways we try to work on that. None of them, and they don't always work. I have patients that we've tried all of the above, and it's still a big problem for them. But those are what I've had the best success with. All right. I think this is the last email that I got. Is there a medication or patch that can be taken for cogwheeling in the legs? Can't walk because of this issue. Well, sort of. So I, I personally, I like in cogwheeling in the legs to cogwheeling anywhere else, which is stiffness. So cogwheel rigidity is what the classic version in Parkinson's disease is, which is when we're passively moving your arms or your wrist or your legs, it, there's a catch. So it kind of goes catch, 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 a lot like a socket wrench or a ratchet. And that's a combination of tremors and stiffness that, that leads to that kind of ratcheting that you have. And you can feel it in the leg sometimes, although we much more commonly feel it in your elbow or in your wrist joint. I would treat it the same way I would treat cogwheeling or stiffness anywhere else, especially if it's causing you walking problems, which generally would involve more medicine. Yes, you would get my spiel about exercise and staying active and all the usual things that I harp on everybody about, but it sounds like you probably need more medicine. And the choice of medicine is variable. It can be carbidopa, levodopa, or a dopamine agonist, or a new pro patch, or a mantidine, or you name it. I use all of these medicines, depending on the individual person, to try to help with the stiff with the stiffness and the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so the short answer is, is in your case, it sounds like we probably need to go back to the drawing board. How do we work on your stiffness or your mobility in general and go from there? Uh, again, if you came to my office and told me that was the problem, that's exactly what we would talk about and figure out how to adjust it. Well, that was the last email that I had, so I'm going to scroll back up here and answer some questions here in my messaging. And again, if you have more questions, feel free to send them in the message or the chat box. That's where I'm going to look next. How long will it be before Crexant is on the market? Well, technically, it's on the market. Um, I have not personally gotten it or used it yet because I think I have a meeting set up with the rep coming up next week to tell me how to get it, give me samples, what kind of hoops do I have to jump through to get it. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know, Crexant is the newest version that was approved of Carbidopa Levodopa. It theoretically is a 
and I'm going to put this in quotation marks, improved version of Retari, which was theoretically an improved version of Cinemat. Um, yes, I threw quotation marks because improved is subjective. Um, it's still several times a day. I think it's just supposed to smooth out the ups and downs. I, again, I haven't personally played with it, but when I was at the Congress this past weekend, I ran into Dr. O. Black, who we trained here and then did fellowship down in Texas and is now a movement disorder specialist out in the Greensburg area, who is a great guy. And he said he was able to get it for one of his patients. Now, I don't know if he just gave him samples or if he was actually able to get it approved, because really my questions are, what kind of hoops am I going to have to jump through to get it? As everybody on this call probably knows, anytime we get something new, they basically ask for my firstborn child before I can actually prescribe it. Um, and so I don't know exactly which hoops I'm going to have to jump through or what you're going to have to have tried first or what insurances are going to cover it or how much it's going to cost. And yes, these are all legitimate questions that I don't know the answers to, but will hopefully within the next month or so know the answers to. Um, but hey, I am in, I am all for anything that helps my patients do better. And if you can give me a new medicine, a better version of a medicine, a new procedure, I'm all for learning about it and trying to figure out where it fits into the regimen or the or the kind of armaments of medicines that we have and, and go from there. Uh, again, I'm not against using new things. I'm all for it. If they tell me that there's a reason for it or there's a way that I can help people function better, that's really my only job. And then another one that was a direct message here is how do COMT inhibitors work? Are they difficult to take? So catecholomethyltransferase is the other enzyme that breaks down dopamine. So monoamine oxidase is the first one we talked about. Catecholomethyltransferase, which is COMT, is the other one. And so again, theoretically, if we inhibit that enzyme, we inhibit the breakdown of dopamine, we keep it around longer, you feel better. Mm. The old version of the COMT inhibitors was actually tolcopone, which I think had liver toxicity and then was taken off the market. Maybe back on the market. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but entacopone is the classic one that's been around forever. That's Comtan. Um, entacopone was added to each dose of carbidopa, levodopa to add about theoretically 30% longer benefit to the life of your dose of Cinemat um, to, again, try to smooth out these ups and downs. This gets into kind of the on-off phenomenon that people often ask about that not everybody feels, but some people really do. When their pills kick in, they feel better. When their pills wear off, they feel worse. That's what you will hear us describe as on-off phenomenon. And the idea is that it's your pills wearing off before your next dose that really leads to the off time. And so if you can add a medicine or add something to what you're doing to extend the life of each dose, then maybe you avoid that downtime or you avoid that wearing off and you smooth out the ups and downs. That's the idea. Um, and so the COMT inhibitors work that way. Now, on Gentis, Apicapone was the newer version that was invented and had the benefit of being one a day. Um, again, it's much harder to get than Intacapone in my experience, but it is something that I also try to add. And again, these medicines are added for people who do have these ups and downs, these fluctuations, to try to smooth it out. It's not the only way to try to smooth it out. And again, this is where the individualization of treatment strategy comes in. There are many different ways we can try to solve any problem you throw at me. If you give me a problem, I can probably come up with about five different reasonable ways to solve that problem. And so if, you know, let's say you come to me and I say, hey, let's add Azelec to what we're doing to see if we can smooth out the ups and downs. But then you say, oh, but my friend came and you put her on Comtan. Well, there was probably... Maybe. I mean, sometimes I just lose my mind, but there was probably a reason why I decided that for each of you guys individually. It really is an individualized or tailored process, and you have to keep that in mind. But the COMT inhibitors are really another adjunctive medicine, another medicine that I will add to levodopa to see if I can smooth out the ups and downs. Comtan is sometimes difficult to take only because if you're on Cinemet four or five or six times a day, that means I'm adding four or five or six more pills to your regimen. It also turns fluids orange and, you know, does some other side effects. But I, I can't say that it's necessarily difficult to take. It does come with a price or side effects, but that's something that we have to talk about. Once a Parkinson's patient develops hypotension and starts a blood pressure medicine, i.e. fludrocortisone, midodrin, has anyone been able to get off of the medicine? Yes, but I caveat that. <laughs> Yes, in that if something else supports or helps the blood pressure, 
then we can get you off of the medicines that I'm using to support your blood pressure. So orthostatic hypotension is a common problem in my world. Um, as Parkinson's disease progresses, these autonomic problems become more of an issue. Um, then there's other issues like multiple systems atrophy that has it more prominent. But even in typical Parkinson's disease, this is not an uncommon situation. The hard part is, is some people are on medicines to lower their blood pressure. A lot of my patients start with high blood pressure and they come into me on lisinopril and amlodipine and metoprolol. And a lot of times we're able to take some of those medicines away. And so let's say I put you on Florinef or Midodrin, but you're also on lisinopril and you go back to your primary care doctor and they say, ah, maybe you don't need that anymore. And they take you off of it and your blood pressure is good. Okay, I can get you off those medicines. The Parkinson's disease drugs also tend to lower your blood pressure. And so that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Now, let's say, and again, this is theoretical, but let's say we do DBS and then you are able to cut your medicines in half and your blood pressure stabilizes. Maybe we can get you off of it. Or let's say you just do a great job and you eat a bunch of salt and you, and you, you drink enough water and you stay hydrated and you use support or compression stockings or an abdominal binder, which are all the other non-medication ways to try to boost your blood pressure. And you really do a good job and, and you're able to maintain your blood pressure. I have no problems taking you off of medicines that I put you on if they are no longer needed. <clears throat> One of the things I like to tell my patients is, is I don't want you to keep taking medicines that are not helpful. That's not a great plan. And so the short answer to your question is yes, occasionally some people are able to come off of their medicines once I put them on. But again, that usually means we had to do something else to try to correct the problem that I added those medicines for. But if we're able to, I am all for re-evaluating, re re-examining, re-taking a look at the medicines that you're taking and seeing if you still need them. Maybe you needed them 10 years ago, but now 10 years fast forward, you have a different set of problems. Maybe we need to adjust which medicines I have you on. It's always a good idea to think about the medicines that you're taking and see whether or not we really do still need them. Hmm. Of the three ways to initially program DBS, monopolar review, Medtronic brain survey, brain sense, Boston scientific brain mapping, which has been proven to be the most effective. You, you know they have not been compared head to head, and you know they never will be because nobody's going to try to answer that question. And it also depends on a whole lot of other things. It also depends on who the programmer is, how many years of experience they have. Even with the brain sense or the Boston Scientific Mapping, I would still argue that if you have somebody who has been doing deep brain stimulator adjustments for many, many years, you are still going to get better success even with those techniques than using those techniques in somebody's hands who is not as experienced or as good. Um, and so it, to my knowledge, those different ways to initially program DBS have never been compared head to head. I think they all are good. They all have pros and cons. And, and I do think with the advent of these newer computer generated suggestions, I think it has gotten easier for the programmers. Um, but I don't know that necessarily one is better than another. And I think a lot of times it depends on the hands of the person doing the programming in addition to the technique that they use. Can you get DBS after having high frequency ultrasound? I believe so. So I believe you can have a high frequency ultrasound ablation and then get deep brain stimulator surgery. However, you cannot go the other direction. As far as I know, you cannot have deep brain stimulator surgery and then try to undergo high frequency ultrasound ablation. They're not going to MRI or they're not going to ablate where we have wires in your brain. I have not experienced that. I have not had anybody yet, at least to this point, um, have a high frequency ultrasound or any type of ablation and then go have DBS. But I know there are case reports or there are stories of this. Um, so I do know it is possible, um, but I have not experienced that yet. <clears throat> Could you talk a little bit about the connection between falling and Parkinson's? About five years ago, I fell the whole way down our 14-step stairway. Terrible decision. Incredibly, I wasn't seriously injured. Extremely lucky. But I did bang my head very hard several times on the way down. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's about four years later. Ah, okay. Uh, any connection? Well, let's ask Brett Favre, right? Um, there is some data 
and some suggestion that repeated head injury leads to Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease. Again, for the longest time, we thought Muhammad Ali was probably more of a, a that type of a deal. Although later in, in time, it came out that he had perhaps just typical Parkinson's disease and maybe it was unrelated. Although I, I still am not entirely convinced that getting pummeled in the head that many times didn't at least play some role in the brain not functioning as correctly as it should. Um, and the same thing is true with the most recent person to come out, which was Brett Favre, again, a quarterback for those of you who don't follow sports, um, who I'm assuming had multiple concussions throughout his career. I have no idea how many. I haven't done any reading on Brett Favre yet. Um, but my guess is he got hit in the head once or twice. And so we do think there is a connection between head injury, brain injury, concussions, and later development of Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and some of these neurodegenerative conditions. Um, do I know that you falling down 14 steps and hitting your head along the way is what triggered your Parkinson's disease? No. Do I have any way to prove that? Of course not. Could it have been that you were going to develop Parkinson's disease and you just took out some of those brain cells a little bit earlier when you banged your head on the steps down the, down the stairwell? Maybe. Um, could it be that, yes, that is what caused your Parkinson's disease? Maybe. I don't have a way to prove any of this. The short answer is, is falling is a terrible idea, um, particularly for patients with Parkinson's disease, but for anybody in general. And I don't think we're, we're at the point where we can say for sure, yes, that's what caused it or no. What I would recommend is not doing it again, uh, because falling is also the most dangerous problem in patients with Parkinson's disease. So falling is the number one thing that lands my patients in the hospital. And again, I know we've talked about this, but you're just going to have to take take my word for it. The hospital is not a very good place for you. Yes, if you were having an emergency, you absolutely need to go to the hospital. I don't want you to take this incorrectly, but man, I really hope that you guys do everything you can do to stay out of the hospital. 10 times out of 10, bad things happen to my patients when they end up in the hospital. They get significantly confused. They hallucinate. They get agitated. They get combative. They get medicated. They get tied down to the bed. They don't get out of bed for four or five days or a week or two, and then they invariably almost never go back home. I would bet 75% of people in the audience right now have either heard of, know, or have had the exact experience that I just rattled off in 30 seconds because I have heard this story far too many times. Again, I am not saying you should not go to the hospital if you were having an emergency. That is false. But really, you need to do everything you can do in your power to stay out of it, which usually means, again, getting your vaccines, trying to stay not infected, because infection is probably the second most common thing that leads people to the hospital, but staying off the ground. Falling is your most dangerous problem. Super important that you try to figure out a way to do it. Again, coming back to head trauma, brain trauma, repeated injuries, does it lead to Parkinsonism? Probably. Um, but at the end of the day, can I say that's what triggered you in in, in your fall downstairs? Mm, not with any certainty, but it cer certainly seems interesting. When it comes to PSP, <clears throat> progressive supranuclear palsy, which is one of the Parkinson's plus conditions, which has a much shorter life expectancy, does the start time frame begin when symptoms are first noticed or more when a test is performed to confirm? Do you find it easier to tell when someone is moving through the stages versus Parkinson's that someone can have for decades? Well, that's a hard question. PSP is usually a much faster progressing condition. It doesn't respond as well to the medicines. It leads to more falls or much more common and much quicker disability. Um, the start time frame is subjective. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, none of us really know when any of these things start. And a lot of, most of us, if not all of us, believe that it, all of the Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's-like conditions or Parkinson's plus conditions start a long time before you hit my office. Um, it, it's a little bit easier to tell the progression through the stages, but realistically, I would argue that in progressive supranuclear palsy, most of the time by those patients come to my office, the disease has already progressed much more or much quicker than, say, your typical Parkinson's patient who comes to my office. Um, again, and so I, I don't – I know we've talked about the staging system in Parkinson's disease, which I don't particularly care for because it's not a linear scale – the time between stage one and two and three and four and five are not the same. You don't spend the same amount of time in each stage or each level. And so I don't find it useful in day-to-day -day practice to say, oh, you're a stage three. Oh, you're heading to stage four. Those numbers really don't tell us a whole lot. But I do feel like I noticed progression in PSP 
more than I notice progression in Parkinson's disease because it typically happens quicker and over a much shorter time frame. What is the typical dose of rosagiline? How often per day? So you, it's generally one milligram once a day. One of the benefits or one of the reasons why we like Azelect is that it's easy. So if you haven't noticed, the vast, vast majority of the medicines that we give you are multiple times per day. We really do not have great medicines that are long lasting. Rosagiline is one of the ones that last a long time. And so we like it. Now, the downside to Rosagiline is it's pretty weak. I would say a third of people really don't notice any difference, maybe even half. Um, but some people do, and this is why I still use it. It's another good medicine to add to the regimen or armamentarium that we have. Um, it's generally well tolerated, but again, it, it isn't necessarily a kind of a, a showstopper like carbidopa, levodopa is, or pramipex, pramipexol is. Um, it's another adjunctive medicine that I'll use. Um, and, and one of the best benefits to it is it's actually pretty easy. It's just one pill a day. Are there physical therapists or occupational therapists in the South Hills that are focused on Parkinson's disease? Probably. Casey's probably actually the better person trying to answer that question. Although somebody in my office also has a list that I could probably find if I asked enough people. You would think I would know where this list is and you are probably right, but that doesn't mean that I do. Uh, but this is why I have help. This is why I have a whole team of people who support me and tell me where to go and what to do. Um, Casey, do you know the answer to that question offhand? Real yes. Quick? Yes. We have a map and there's definitely providers in the South Hills. So contact me and I will get you some names and numbers. I was going to say, I feel like the South Hills isn't as bad as the, the North. I would say the area between like Catanning and Erie is where we really run into trickiness in terms of trying to find people. But that's just my experience. I might not be accurate on that, but that's where I feel like it's the hardest to find Parkinson's disease specific therapist. And then the second question is, how do you actually pick a physical or occupational therapist? And so if you don't know of somebody, or if you don't have the list, let's say you forget Casey's number or contact information, although if you're on this, you probably have it. Um, what I would say is look for somebody who advertises or says that they know how to do the big and loud program. Now, I'm not suggesting you have to do the big and loud program. So this is Parkinson's disease specific physical and speech therapy. And they're intense. They're four days a week for four weeks. These are intense programs. But if you happen to stumble across a physical therapist or an occupational therapist or a speech therapist who tells you that they know how to do these things, then that leads me to believe that they also have some knowledge about Parkinson's disease and can use that in day-to-day -day practice. But the short answer how to pick a PT or OT is probably to contact Casey at the foundation and say, hey, this is where I live. This is what I'm looking for, who you got. And I feel like she can give you a map on that one. Sorry, I just opened a link that was for the next question. The best way to take a pill according to science. Research is examining the mechanics of drug dissolution in the natural anatomy of the stomach found that taking a pill while lying on your right side shortens the time it takes for medicines to be absorbed. I mean, I guess that makes sense. I mean, at the end of the day, that is where the outlet of your stomach goes. So your stomach kind of kind of comes down, the stomach curves to the right, and then your small intestines go that direction. So I guess gravity would just be helping if you're laying on your right. I don't know that anybody's ever told me, hey, you know, I seem to do better when I take my pills in this position, um, but I'm not against trying anything. And so try it, see what happens. Do a little bit of an experiment. Vicki or Donna, you really want to tell me? Well, I just wanted people to hear about the time that it, it saves you on maybe getting your cinnamon to work faster because it goes into the intestines faster when it's delivered to the bottom of the stomach. And they talked about like 108 minutes compared to 13 minutes. So it seems rather significant for Parkinson's. And they really did the study based on all medicines. And for seniors in a nursing home, if they wanted, like they can't sit up or whatever, like sit, standing up is also effective of delivering it faster. Rather and I'm just looking at it now. I mean, I, I don't, it, obviously this was, as you mentioned, in everybody. So I don't think they necessarily looked at Parkinson's disease, which has its own set of problems from a stomach standpoint, which is slowed gastric emptying, slowed motility, everything. Um, 
again, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you're right. The time from 100 minutes down to 23 minutes, at least according to what they were looking at, 2.3 times faster. Some of the things that I see just looking at this quickly look pretty impressive. Try it. Uh, again, try it and report back to me. Let me know if you feel any difference um, taking your pills in certain positions. Um, I don't want to say do an experiment because that would be a little bit of a push, but do a little bit of trial and error and see what happens. Again, I don't think you're going to do yourself any harm in terms of trying different positions to be in when you take your pills. Um, I, I don't, I can't think of any way that would be dangerous, damaging, unless you're choking on them. So maybe don't take them while you're lying flat if you have swallowing problems. But at the end of the day, if there is a way to try to help your pills work better, and especially if that makes that makes you need an increase in your dose or a change in your medicine less, I'm all for it because that makes my job easier. So feel free to try it and let me know how it goes. And um, if you're onto something, I'll start telling people about it. I, again, I, I take it with a grain of salt because again, these things are, were not tested necessarily in patients with stomach or gastric problems, I would imagine. Um, but again, I don't see any harm there. And so try it. As Parkinson's disease appears to be more of a syndrome than a disease, which I agree with you and we'll come back to in a second, do you see anything besides exercise, which obviously is my favorite topic, that might be a universal benefit that aids the wide variety of this illness among patients? So I actually just read something on this, or maybe this was at the conference. So exercise is definitively the answer. Uh, there was something that suggested limiting red meat also might be beneficial and vitamin D might be beneficial. Now, vitamin D is probably something we, I take vitamin D, FYI. Um, I also am not very good at going to the doctor, also FYI. And so I, I doctored myself and suggested that I take my own vitamin D because most people in Pittsburgh have not very good vitamin D sources. So you generally get vitamin D from the sun. And even though right now I'm looking out my window and I actually see sunlight, I feel like that's pretty unusual for Pittsburgh. Um, but I read something that vitamin D was suggestive to potentially be um, good for people with Parkinson's disease, again, in terms of disease progression. Now, you, the start of the question is, is Parkinson's disease appears to be more of a syndrome than a disease? And I said, I agreed with that. Why is that the case? Well, at the end of the day, Parkinson's disease is diagnosed based on symptoms. So a constellation of symptoms is what gets you the diagnosis of Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease. And that's more of a syndrome than a disease. However, probably the biggest topic at the Congress that I was just at this past weekend in Philadelphia um, was there's a large talk about how us as movement disorders or us as a society are going into in the future defined Parkinson's disease. And the sh it, it's a lot of controversy around using biomarkers as part of the diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease, i.e. alpha-synuclein and Lewy body pathology, which are the pathological hallmarks or thought to be the pathological hallmarks of Parkinson's disease. So when you actually think about a disease, I think about an underlying specific pathophysiological problem that leads to a certain set of symptoms. That is not what we have in Parkinson's disease. We have a whole bunch of different underlying pathophysiological mechanisms, genetics, environmental triggers, so on and so forth, that lead up to a constellation of symptoms, i.e. making this more of a syndrome, in my opinion. Um, I think that that's important because to get to the answer to the second part of your question, which is, is there anything coming up that's particularly beneficial in terms of disease modification or keeping people doing better longer? I really think that comes to us transitioning from a syndrome to a disease. I think we have a much better chance of disease modifying medications or cures if we have a specific underlying problem. So if you have a specific genetic condition or specific pathology that I can find through testing or through a blood test or whatever, I have a much better chance of finding a medicine or, a, or an intervention. I won't even say a medicine, an intervention that fixes that than I do trying to take all comers who come with the symptoms. And, and so I really do think the transition from a syndrome to a disease is really almost step one in terms of finding disease modification or potential cure. Now, there's a lot of back and forth about that. So if you take what I think is the second most common genetic version of Parkinsonism outside of glucocerebrosidase, which is LARC2, 
it turns out that about half of patients with LARC2 do not have alpha-synuclein pathology or Lewy body formation, and yet they have the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so this is where it gets tricky because not everybody follows the same rules, which is why it really is a syndrome. And so when we're trying to decide who actually has Parkinson's disease and who doesn't, label, labeling these people based on pathology maybe limit some people that right now we call Parkinson's disease. And so the long story short is there's a lot of talk about this at the above me level. So the important people, the researchers, the officers and the president of the Movement Disorder Foundation or, or Movement Disorder Society. Um, and these are all things that were, were heavy in the talks that I went to this past weekend um, because I really do think it impacts how we view Parkinson's disease. And more importantly, how do we get to the point where we can really start finding disease modifying medications, disease altering you know, medications or treatments or things that slow down or potentially fix the disease? That's really what it's going to come down to. All right, we got the map. All right. Are there psychologists experienced with Parkinson's and counseling for couples? I have no idea, actually. Casey, do you know the answer to that? I, I mean, I, I, I actually have not come across a psychiatrist or a psychologist who really has a lot of interest. I used to have one. Um, I used to have a psychiatrist who came to my DBS meetings who had an interest in Parkinson's disease and modulation, but then he moved to Boston. And I really have not found a psychologist or a psychiatrist that has specialized or expertise or a lot of knowledge in Parkinson's disease. Casey? Yes, it's very limited. I know there's some neuropsychologists. We do have neuropsychologists. I have a neuropsychologist in my, my mm -hmm. department here um, who is – in that's Dr. Carol Schramke. She's the one that I send patients to for neurocognitive testing, particularly before deep brain stimulator surgery or things like that. Um, but even her – I mean, she definitely has more knowledge than your average person, and she does do some actual clinical counseling and therapy too. I don't know if she necessarily does couples, couples therapy or things like that, um, but she definitely does psychotherapy as well. And so maybe somebody like that would have a little bit more area of expertise or benefit in terms of dealing with neurodegenerative conditions, Parkinson's disease, and so on and so forth. But actually out in the community, typical psychiatrist, typical psychologist, typical therapist, I think it's one of those unmet needs that I really haven't come across or nobody's told me about that, hey, this person, first of all, these people are the hardest people to find on in the world at the moment anyway. I'm actually easier to get into than they are, and that tells you something. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, they are extremely difficult to find, and I really have not found anybody specifically who has interest. Casey, you can keep me updated if you find somebody. I often look on psychology today and you can choose chronic disease. So I, I can help a little bit. You're welcome to reach out to me. Perfect. What to do when swallowing a pill becomes hard to do? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I, speech therapy, first and foremost, that's my favorite place to start. You probably need a modified Bram swallower to try to figure out is there a mechanical problem or what specifically is the swallowing problem. And then the speech therapist works on different exercises or techniques to try to make it better and, and more beneficial. If it's a wearing off problem, so if your swallowing problem of pill is because you're stiff or you're contracted, okay, maybe we need to adjust the timing of your medicines, but swallowing really is a challenge and a problem. And outside of speech therapy, if it's not something that responds to more medicine, I don't really have a good solution for you. But it's super important because choking and ending up in the hospital with aspiration pneumonia is a terrible idea. And so don't don't ignore it. You definitely need to bring it up. We need to get you to a speech therapist, so on and so forth. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions? I, I was laughing at the next comment. Uh, Do you have any suggestions for axial dystonia? I tried carbidopa, levodopa, but didn't help. Would Botox help? So axial trunk spine, dystonia, muscle spasm. So dystonia is just a description of a movement. Dystonia means abnormal muscle contractions, usually agonist and antagonistic or competing muscles contracting at the same time, leading to fixed and twisting postures. Um, and you can get that in your trunk. So it, thinking about kind of the lean in people with Parkinson's disease or Pisa syndrome, or when it gets particularly bad, it gets a fancy name called Camptochormia, which is basically completely flexed forward. 
These can be axial dystonias, either standalone or in Parkinson's disease. If carbidopa levodopa absolutely doesn't work, meaning we've ramped it up and we really haven't had a lot of success, there are other medicines you can try. So you can use the anticholinergic medicines, which is really what we would typically use for dystonia. So this is benztropine trihexafenadyl. You can use muscle relaxers. Again, you can use muscle relaxers for just about anything. You can use benzos, so clonazepam, you know, uh, diazepam, Valium. Uh, sometimes these medicines help. But everything that I just mentioned comes with a price, and so does Botox injections, which is the other choice. The hard part about Botox is figuring out which muscles are the problem. So botulinum toxin and Botox, and, and, and I use Botox, but really it's botulinum toxin. Botox is a brand name for those of you who don't know. There's four, now five commercially available versions of botulinum toxin, and I use all of them. Um, but botulinum toxin is good if you can pinpoint the specific muscles that are overactive. Now, this is where I tell all of my patients Botox is an art more than a science. When I'm doing injections for Botox, again, especially when you're doing dystonia or a muscle contracting problem, the goal is to weaken the muscles that are overactive enough that they're not overactive, but not so much that they're underactive while avoiding the muscles that are compensating for the overactive muscles. Now you know why it's an art. Um, and yes, we have EMG and even ultrasound sometimes is used in various places to try to help, but it's still an art trying to accomplish that goal. And when you're thinking about the paraspinal muscles or the trunk muscles, those are deep muscles. Those are not not always easy to hit. And so, yes, if you have a dystonic spasm that's sticking out and I can see it and it's localized to one area, I've done Botox for that and had mixed results or some success. But if you have more of a diffuse process, that is a much harder problem to try to do with injections. Because you can only give so much in, you know, botulinum toxin throughout the body before you start causing problems or, pretend, or it can even get covered through insurance. And trying to pinpoint those muscles, and especially if you think about the potential complication, the side effect of weakening your trunk muscles is going to be worse in posture, difficulty with standing, so on and so forth. And so while I think it's an option, um, it, it's something that you would really have to discuss with me or whoever would be doing it to see if they think it would be a reasonable thing to try. Or do you need to go back to the drawing for medications? Or do we need to start thinking about deep brain stimulator surgery, which is also used for dystonia? I mean, these are all the things that I would think about if you were coming to my office. <laughs> I, I laughed when I said, Doc, what do you mean when you say above me? So I am not important in the movement disorder world, believe it or not. Uh, there are much more important people making decisions than me. So in the movement disorder society, there's a president, there's a cabinet, there's it's just like every other organization you can think of. Um, and these are really the people who are the ones who are putting out the journals that I have a whole bunch of over there. They're the ones who put on the Congress that I was just at last weekend. Um, they're the ones who really do a lot of make decision making. Now, even they get outranked by government officials. And so when it comes to getting things approved or getting legislature passed, they, they do lobby through the government to get things done. Um, but so that's what I mean when I say above me. There's a lot of people above me. Um, all right. Looks like I got one more question and two minutes to answer it. So I feel like that was that was pretty good time time utilization by me. Is focused ultrasound an option for those who do not have tremor predominant Parkinson's disease? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it's approved for tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. Would they do it in somebody who is not tremor predominant? Maybe. But again, my experience in Parkinson's disease is fairly limited. I have only had a very small number of Parkinson's disease patients go get focused ultrasound. I've had a handful or more with essential tremor go get focused ultrasound. So I have a little bit more experience with that. But I have very limited experience with Parkinson's disease getting ultrasound. Um, partly, again, because I don't have direct access to it here. If anybody wants to give me an extra $3 million, I would absolutely be willing to get one here and, and put in the work to figure out how to make that happen. But that's about how much they cost, in case you were wondering. Um, it's on my list of things to do. I see Dr. Woodward, who's my new partner here, that's a, a, on his list of things to do as well. Um, because, again, I do think it has its use. But because I don't have as much experience with it, I don't have the answer to that question. I have much more experience with deep brain stimulator surgery, which we definitely do for people who don't necessarily have tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. But when it comes to the less, we'll call it less invasive versions, I have much less experience and I know it's approved for essential tremor and tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. And my understanding of it is, yes, it potentially does have 
some benefit for the stiffness and for the mobility in general, it's predominantly best used for tremor. Now, DBS is also best used for tremor. So that's not nothing, that's not a knock on ultrasound. It's just that's kind of what it's been traditionally used for. So more to come on that. Once I get, once we get it more in Pittsburgh. Now I heard UPMC was supposed to be getting one in spring. They don't have one yet, so I haven't heard an update on that yet. Uh, again, I'm going to keep talking to my powers to be because guess what? I'm not the boss here either. Uh, the powers that be to see what we can do here, but. Until then, I still send my patients elsewhere, and that gives me much less experience. But as I get and collect more and more experience, I will report back to you what my experience is, and then I think I can give you a better answer on that one. And with that, it is exactly 545, so Casey, I will send it back to you um, because I also don't know what the date of our next one is, and I assume you do. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Licklider. The next Talk with the Doc is on Thursday, November 7th. Thank you, Karen, as always. And it was nice to see some of you at Step Forward last weekend. Thank you for attending and supporting. And we have two webinars coming up this month, one by Dr. O'Black. We do have the registration up, and it's on Parkinson's and intimacy. So that is an important topic that is discussed not so often. That is on October 15th, and then we have one on employment issues on October 29th. And, and I don't know who's doing the employment here. one, but Dr. O'Black is definitely a good guy. I highly recommend him. Yeah. So the employment one is by a lawyer. And oh, they, they make me nervous. So I will have no comment on that. Okay. But we'll see you back here on November 7th. Thank you, everybody. Have Thanks, a good guys. evening. Have a good one.